Exam one review. So we started off spending quite a lot of time uh, looking at the first major topic I would say is units. Right, this is going to be conversions and dimensional homogeneity. Right, so dimensional homogeneity is something we spent a lot of time on, where we converted from an equation with one unit set, or maybe you had an equation with unknown units and you had to use the rules of it to, uh, to work it out. So if you recall that if plus and minus, you have to have the same units for times and divide. Basically, anything is OK. <clears throat> right? You can cross units off. You can add them together. You can multiply them, all these different things. Uh, equal sign, you have to have same units. And we also talked about transcendental functions. So like exp or log or sine or any of these different functions, these have to be unitless. All right, so ultimately, what, <coughs> excuse me, whatever you are putting into the brackets of these exponential functions, these transcendental functions, they all have to be unitless. So we can use the units to help solve a problem. And I would argue if you don't understand the units of an equation, you don't really understand the equation itself. The units are a really critical part especially even if you get to really complex units, if you manipulate them through calculus operations, differentials, integrals, the units still hold true, right? So dm dt, right, change of mass as a function of time, should have units of mass over time, right? Even though it's a differential, it doesn't matter. It's the same, same rules. Then we, uh, <clears throat> the next topic that we really covered Uh, was engineering basics. In this we had several categories. So for unit meaning, we talked a lot of time, we spent a lot of time talking about temperature and pressure. What is the fundamental physical meaning of temperature and pressure? Uh, in terms of temperature, what is your reference state? What is your temperature interval? Right, so that means converting between uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin, and Rankine. Right, it's not as simple as just throwing out a unit conversion like it would be for converting centimeters to feet. Because right? these all have different uh, bases and reference states. With pressure, we have atmospheric pressure, gauge, and absolute pressure. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the air surrounding the unit operation. <coughs> gauge pressure is any pressure difference. Most commonly, the gauge pressure is between the absolute and the atmospheric, because it's just easy, because the atmosphere is always there. But you could have a gauge pressure in between two tanks, for example. Right? It's just a differential pressure. Absolute pressure is what you would put into the ideal gas law. That is the actual complete pressure that the gas is exerting on its surrounding wall. But the gauge pressure would be the difference if I had a membrane and I had one gas on one side and one gas on the other, the gauge pressure is the net force being pushed on that. Right, that would be the gauge pressure. <clears throat> uh, we talked about hydrostatic pressure. And this where P is that the pressure of the bottom of a column of fluid is going to be equal to the pressure pushing at the top of the column plus the density, acceleration of gravity, and the height of the column. And so if we were to draw this out, we have a column of fluid that is some H tall, it has some pressure pushing on it, and the fluid is of some density. The denser the fluid, the more pressure you're going to have at the bottom of your column. So in our case, the pressure that's pushing on us right now is air, which is a fluid going from us all the way to the tippy top of outer space. But that's a whole lot of air and not a whole lot of pressure. Right? That's because the density of air is not all that high. Right? So it takes a lot of air to push on us to get the, the equivalent of 
one atmosphere. Yes. Would that still be the so then would that be the absolute pressure very bottom? At the very bottom, yes. If you knew the density of air over a period of height, the pressure of space is zero, this would be the absolute pressure that we would measure here, which in that case would actually be the atmospheric pressure in this circumstance. So atmospheric pressure is the absolute pressure of the atmosphere. So that is content that many of you may have already seen. The new, the new content that we talked about next was material balances. And here we had a lot of different items to talk, that we talked about. We talked about process flow diagrams. Process. Basically, how do we take a word problem and turn it into a drawing with unknown variables? Right? That's really the challenge in this part here. Uh, we did degrees of freedom analysis. This we did for reacting systems and for non-reacting systems. Basically, how much information do we need to solve this particular problem? Now, degrees of freedom analysis is most useful when we're trying to figure out which unit operation to do our balances on first, especially when you have multiple unit processes. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go through and do a super rigorous degrees of freedom analysis, but looking at how many unknowns there are and roughly thinking through your heads how many pieces of information, that'll get you 90% of the way there. Right? Codifying it down and writing out exactly the details, sure that will be formal and nice, but in terms of an exam setting, I don't think it's necessarily a wise use of your time. But if you've done the homework diligently, you should have a pretty intuitive sense of which, uh, which processes will have the fewest degrees of freedom, which is what we want. Ideally, zero. So we also have molecule, atom, So I'm lumping all of them, non-reacting and reacting, into the same category here, whereas the molecule balance is typically what we would do for a non-reacting system, but then atom and the extensive reaction approach are the balance strategies that we used for reacting systems predominantly. Now you could, of course, use the molecule balance, and this would be for the uh, general balance equation, in minus out plus generation minus consumption is equal to accumulation. If we were to apply a molecule balance to a non-reacting system, you would have no generation, no consumption, and typically we're going to be assuming it's an open steady state process, so no accumulation. So the molecule balance is what we started off to use. Or a mass balance. We could also say this is, you know, we also have the mass balance, which is not strictly molecules, right? It's mass in, mass out. We talked about, uh, Multiple unit processes. And one of the most studied ones that we looked at was the reactor separator. You should hopefully be able to draw a reactor separator with your eyes closed in your sleep. Hopefully by this point, because we've done it several, several times. And lastly, we talked about combustion reactions. Right, and combustion reactions are no different than any other chemical reaction, but the difference is that you have specialized nomenclature, excess oxygen, uh, what are the reactions that are actually taking place? You always make CO2 in water. What is incomplete combustion? Right, and one thing I would like to highlight is that carbon monoxide formation is not at all related to excess O2. It doesn't matter if the real process is making carbon monoxide. When you're asked to calculate the excess oxygen or the theoretical oxygen, it is assuming that everything burns to completion with CO. So even if there's CO in the outlet stream and you're asked to solve for what the excess oxygen is, you ignore it. You assume that it's CO2. You treat it like CO2. Okay, so... Yes. <laughs> so if you have like five moles second of CO from the CO2. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you were to do your atom balance, 
right? For every one CO that is formed, you're consuming one carbon. But for every one carbon, you need one O2. Right? That's the way to think about it. Not that creating CO2 requires half an O2, right? And then calculating what your theoretical oxygen would be there. Right? So for example, if you have carbon plus O2, this goes to CO2. Carbon plus one half O2 goes to CO. So if you're mistakenly thinking that the excess oxygen is balancing these two combined reactions together, as you might expect for, let's say, any other generic chemical reaction, right? But this reaction here is not considered a sort of complete ideal combustion reaction. So the way to think about it is if you have CO in your product stream and you're trying to figure out what would have my theoretical oxygen been, for example, instead of going from CO to the oxygen required, instead you should go from CO to the carbon required and then from the carbon take it back through the actual pathway. Yeah? Would this work if, if we were given you have five moles per second of, um, of methane going in and 20% excess oxygen. Mm -hmm. We figure out everything that, and then we're also set, shown, and by the way, it's also 90% uh, fully, com mm -hmm. full, full <coughs> yep. we figure everything out and then we'd be able to figure out, okay, then this is how much carbon monoxide is coming. In that circumstance, yeah, it would be pretty straightforward because you know exactly how much methane you have coming into the system. And then 20% excess, you can directly balance the oxygen for the feed. But in the outlet, so in this, this circumstance where people get, typically get tripped up is if we were to have a circumstance here, well, let's just say we're burning like solid graphite carbon. Let's say we're burning a diamond. We'll be exotic, right? So we're burning diamond, solid, solid carbon. Right, and this is actually a fun, honestly, fun fact. Uh, law of conservation of mass. I think this was what, Lavoisier? Uh, that's how he actually did this. He burned a diamond in pure oxygen and then discovered that uh, it was no change in mass. So the law of conservation of mass back in the 1600s uh, was actually burning a diamond. Uh, so let's say, for example, that in this circumstance, we're burning uh, one solid carbon atom, or one mole of it, right? Uh, and let's say the outlet here is, I don't know, uh, 0 0.5 CO2 and 0 0.5 CO. What, should, what is the theoretical oxygen required for this reaction, for this process? What is the theoretical oxygen? So I have one vote for 102. What else we got? So the theoretical oxygen. So I've heard three halves, I think, was one. Uh, what, was, what was another one? Three fourths. Three fourths. Okay, so let's, let's go vote. Okay, three fourths. Who's a, who's a three fourths fan? Okay, who's a two thirds fan? Who's a one? It's one. One carbon requires one O2. This doesn't matter. So it is one O2 required. Yes? Um, so would it be easier? I mean, I guess if we're only given the outlets, you have to back it out. Yeah. Do that whole process. Would it be easier if we're given like an inflow stream? We just do it. Balance the carbon inflow with the oxygen. So this, so this is legit. So we could ask this, right? Degrees of freedom wise, mathematically, it's consistent. What a more likely reality situation is is let's say we are let's say we are generating CO, but let's say we had uh, one point one o two, right? An alternative question I could ask, like in an exam setting, is saying, okay, if I have one mole of carbon coming in and one point one moles of oxygen coming in. Here's my outlet composition. What is my excess oxygen? Right? It's essentially the same question. 
But in this case here, we have the two inlet streams defined. Right? So instead of saying it's theoretical oxygen and having you calculate it, I'm going to give you the oxygen flow rate and tell me what the excess is. So what is the excess in this circumstance? 10% because we don't care about the CO. Right? All we care about for calculating excess oxygen is for the feed content itself. So it should just, just be the one point that you yeah, so it would be the theoretical oxygen is 1, 0.1 divided by 1 is 10%, so it's 10% excess. Okay, how do we feel about that? That's, I find that's the trickiest part of combustion. Uh, yeah? You mentioned that um, the excess is determined by the feed. Mm -hmm. is it, would that be the same if it were a reactor separator? Would it be the feed just into the reactor or the actual feed system? It would be something that we clearly specified. In general, it would be feed to the entire process. But it could, the problem could be worded that I could say that the feed to the reactor, but I would be really clear that not the entire process, just the reactor, right, after the mixer, that would have a certain percent excess. That is something that could be totally asked. But I would make it crystal clear, and that's the type of question that I would expect, hopefully if you're confused, to shoot your hand up in the exam and I'll clarify. I don't, I don't want people to get the, you know, the, the flow diagram wrong for a technicality of wording. I, I'll try and make it as clear as possible. So, so you would say if it was like excess at the reactor? So if, I were to say, so if it's a reactor separator and I said excess to the process, I would seem to think that that would be the feed to the entire process. But if I said the excess is the feed to the reactor, Right, then I would be really clear that I would say not the entire process, just the reactor, this is the excess. But I would try and make it crystal clear. So you could have like excess O2 starting Possibly, out, yes. after the mixer. Well, yeah, so for example, you could, envision, you could envision a reactor separator where you have sort of like a, uh, I don't know if this is actually a process um, that's commercially used, but you can envision a process where you would have a reactor separator Right, and the key thing to keep in mind about these reactor separator designs, this is like a large, large footprint of a chemical plant. This is not like something you just put in a little box over there. There's lots of integrated and moving parts. <clears throat> right, you can envision having an additional feed stream right up here that would maybe make up for a deficiency in a compound. Right, for a controls perspective, right, you'll probably want to have a, an additional source to interject some, some maybe reagent to let you balance things out because maybe there's a hiccup or maybe your conversion is lower than you expect. Maybe all of a sudden you get a higher conversion than you expect. Right? So it's totally reasonable that you might have a separate makeup stream here to smooth things out and give you some controls. And if this was the circumstance, right, then you would expect that maybe the design specification here is the important part for the controls of that makeup stream. Right, but that's something that seems totally reasonable to have in, in a chemical plant. Yeah. So if it was, um, so if you're, so if you didn't have like a conversion uh, ratio, then could you do uh, molecule balance if it was just 100%? Uh, if what was what was 100%? If so, this was so, so if your stuff went in and it reacted 100% and it came out in mm -hmm. and your uh, reaction separator into two like pure streams, could you do like a uh, did you do in, in is equal to out for that situation? Uh, so you're saying if the reaction if the reaction goes to 100% completion, <coughs> if the reaction goes to 100% completion, you do not need a recycle stream. Oh. Okay. You would basically because there's no there's, so the recycle stream is to make so the whole goal of this reactor separator is the single pass conversion. Let's say is some unknown amount x. The entire conversion should be greater than x. If you have the conversion of the entire process is Y, the conversion of the single pass is X, your goal is to get your overall conversion to be higher than your single pass conversion. That's the ideal goal of the reactor separator. So if you're getting a good enough reaction by a single pass, and some reactors only need a single pass, then, then there's no point to do, a, to do a whole reactor separator process. And that's just in 100%. That's the only time you would ever get rid of that recycling. Not necessarily. I mean, you, let's, say, let's say your single pass is 80%, but it might cost a lot of money to rebuild everything and redesign it for a loop cycle. So you just purge it? Yeah, it could be. Okay. And a lot of times these purge streams will just burn them. Right? You'll just mix it in with 
the natural gas feed to the plant or you'll burn it to help make steam or something like that. It's not, you're not just throwing it away. And by throwing it away, you're just burning it basically. Or maybe there's something else, you could squeeze out some other products or something like that, yeah. So back to the other question. Mm -hmm. So if you have an atom and, uh, sorry, could you do an atom balance? Yeah. For the combustion uh, process here? Yeah, I just yeah. want to see it. Yeah. Uh, oh, or actually, to, to balance this out? Yeah. The way oh, yeah, we could, uh, we could do that real quick. Um, let me erase this over here. Just finish our a little example. Yeah, because, so, would, so for your extent of, or if you're going to do an extent, extended reaction balance, mm -hmm. would you include the, uh, the CO then? In that case? Of course, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's just, let's just do that really quickly. So if this is our feed, what are we missing in our outlet? O2. We're missing O2. <clears throat> what else? Anything else? It could be carbon. Let's just assume we're burning it to completion, right? So let's say it's a design specification. So right now, we're just missing our O2, right? So what we could do, let's do a carbon balance in our head. We have one mole of solid carbon coming in. For every one carbon, you get one carbon. For every 5, 0.5 CO2s, you get one carbon. 0.5, you get one. So this is clearly one, right? So the carbon is a taken account for. Now for the O2, <clears throat> We have 1.1 times 2 over 1, right? For every 1 O2 molecule, we get 2 oxygens. Leaving the system 0.5 CO2, you get 2 to 1 on that one, plus 0.5 for CO, that's a 1 to 1, plus an unknown amount of O2, in that case there, that's 2 to 1 again. Uh, so if we were to do this math, this is 1, this is 0 0.5. Wait a second. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 0.5, 0.51. Uh, let's see. So this is 2.2. 1.2 2 minus 0 0.5 is equal to over 2 is equal to N O2. 0 0.7 over 2 equals 0 0.35 equals N O2. Yeah. Did you just do it? Oh, sorry. I, I hopefully I didn't make a mistake. I did that pretty quick. No, I was just asking. So did, you just did <coughs> N minus. So what you do up there? Uh, so I took the 1, minus it from the, from the 2.2, and then I took this, put it over there, then I took that 2, divided it over there. Oh, okay. So hopefully it should all work out. Yeah. Yeah, question. With the 0.5s mm -hmm. um, on the left board, were those, oh, here. Were those 0.5 moles, or was that the... Uh, 0.5 moles. Uh, 0.5 moles. Okay, mole, like molar flow rate. Okay. Yeah, and let's, let's just, for the sake of argument, let's do, let's do the extended reaction approach for the same problem, right? Let's just do that. And then, so what you just did was the atom balance. This is an atom balance, right? So what I did here is what kind of an atom balance? An oxygen balance, but not molecular oxygen, atomic oxygen. So O balance, not an O2 balance, right? Okay, so let's think about the extent of reaction approach. How do we use the extent of reaction to solve this problem? What's the first step? What do we need to solve for? Carbons because what's going to be Oh, the extent of reaction approach is actually going to be tricky in this one. Well, because you're burning solid carbon, Right, because the tricky part is we have, we have two reactions. So we have two extensive reactions. So would you have two things then? Yeah, we do. So, okay. So, NCO2 is equal to zero plus extent one. NCO is equal to zero plus extent two, and that's of course if we call this reaction one and reaction two. And O2 is equal to 1.1 minus one times extent one minus uh, 0.5 times extent two. <coughs> How's it, does everyone feel pretty comfortable with this? Okay. Uh, so now we can solve that extent 1 is equal to 0 0.5, extent 2 is equal to 0 0.5, and O2 is equal to 1.1 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 times by 0 0.5. Oh, right, is that the same number? One point one minus this is zero point six minus point five zero point two five, is that right? 
Yeah. Same answer. Worked out the same. Unless I forced it to work out by funny math. Does that say, is that right about Does that say O2 <coughs> So NO2 is equal to 1.1 minus 0.5 minus 0.5 times by 0.5. Because this is the stoichiometric coefficient for oxygen for reaction two. Stoichiometric coefficient of oxygen for reaction one is minus one and minus 0.5. All right, any more questions? So you might not have time to go through all of the examples that I had planned, but this is a, a very good exercise regardless. Uh, so I had an example planned for hydrostatics. <clears throat> um, I won't solve it, but I can set it up just so that everyone can uh, take a look at it and run through it in their heads. We can, set up, we can set up how we would solve it, but not necessarily uh, need to solve it. Uh, let's say we have a column of one fluid stacked on a column of another fluid. Uh, this first section is two meters high, and it is filled with an oil where the density of the oil is equal to, uh, sorry, the specific gravity is 0 0.8. The second column here is also 2 meters. This one is filled with water, in which case the density of the water is going to be equal to 1. We have an absolute pressure gauge, gauge absolute pressure, uh, and it reads 101.3 kilopascals. And at the bottom, we have an additional pressure gauge, but this is a gauge pressure. And it is an unknown amount. So in this particular problem, what I would like is to solve for the atmospheric pressure and the gauge pressure at the bottom. <coughs> And what I'm looking for is I would like this in units of millimeters of mercury and this in kilopascals. Because oftentimes atmospheric pressure is conventionally delivered in millimeters of mercury. And that's what uh, a mercury barometer that you might see in your lab would have. So what I'll do is let's just run through it quickly in our heads, how we might set this problem up, and then I can give you the answers and you can work through the math on your own as an exercise. <clears throat> okay, so what's the first step here? Would you want to solve for the rho g is for your top and your bottom fluid? Yeah, so let's take a look. Let's, let's write out our equations really quickly. So we can use our hydrostatic pressure equation for really any point along this column, right? Yeah. I was just thinking, since we already know the absolute pressure at the um, point between the two fluids, mm -hmm. just take that absolute pressure and add it to the pressure of the column of water. And wouldn't that give us the absolute Almost. at the bottom, and then we can find the gauge? Well, let's start, let's start down there. So let's, let's apply our hydrostatic pressure equation to this position, right at the bottom where we have our gauge pressure. Now, if that would be the case, I'll call this... Uh, equation A. So in equation A, we have <clears throat> the pressure of, let's say, position B. Right? Let's do, let's do it this way. Is that just the pressure of the oil in that case? That would be... Oil in the atmosphere? Yes. Well, let me, let's break it down. So you, you're right, but let me break it down. So the pressure at position A is going to be equal to the density of water times the height of the water times by the acceleration of gravity plus the pressure contribution from point B. Right? 
Because if we neglect all of this up here, the water fluid doesn't know what's going on. All it knows is that the, the water right here is being pushed down. <coughs> Problem is we have two unknowns, right? We don't know the pressure at position A and we don't know the pressure at position B. So if we rewrite the equation, or we look at B, we know that the pressure at point B right, is the same logical flow, except we're just working our way up the column. This would be equal to the density of the oil times the height of the oil times the acceleration of gravity plus what pressure is this here? Atmospheric, Atmospheric pressure. Right, so we know this, we know all of this, so we can solve for atmospheric pressure. Once we know this, we can solve for that pressure and cascade down. Yeah? Wow. I thought we knew what the pressure at B was. I thought you said because the you pressure is the Oh, yeah, true, yeah. You could solve this. Good point. So we could, yeah, these are two actually independent questions, and you didn't have to solve them sequentially. That's good. Answer. Okay, uh, here. So could you just solve backwards and solve for the gauge pressure first and then subtract it from the absolute pressure? Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, so, so yes, you could solve for the absolute pressure at A. That, that's what was observed in the last comment. But in order for us to know what the gauge pressure is at point A, we would have to solve for the atmospheric pressure in the first part. So you still, they are still connected, yes. Yeah. So let me just give the answers. And you can work through it as an exercise. Um, <clears throat> the atmosphere is uh, 642.2 millimeters of mercury. And the P gauge pressure is, oh, I guess in this problem, sorry. I had it in PSI. So you get double, double fun in unit conversions. Uh, 5.12 PSI. <clears throat> Next, two meters, that's kind of a lot of water. Two meters is a lot. I think you'd feel two meters on you. Yeah? Do we need to have the conversion factors written down for those? I'll provide you conversion factors. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll try any conversion factor that I think most people don't know off the top of their head. You know, like inches to feet, I don't typically provide, or like centimeters to meters, I won't provide. But something like this, yeah, I'll give you millimeters of mercury to atmospheres or bars. That, that, that I'm not too concerned about. Yeah. I had a question about <laughs> back to the combustion. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it was the practice exam that you handed us. Uh, you had um, 80, I think it was like 80 moles per second of uh, your product going into the reactor. However, the feed to the reactor, the feed to the process was 100 moles per second. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how you got that 80. Uh, I would have to look at it. Okay. So, so for example, so you would, you should in a reactor separator. Is this for the, uh, the combustion or reactor separator problem on the practice? Oh, my, no, it was the reactor separator. Problem. Okay. So I have I, I I don't know off the top of my head, but in general, the feed to the reactor should be higher than the feed to the process because of your recycle stream, right? Because if you do a material balance on a mixer, mm -hmm. right, and when it's mixing back around, unless it's like a negative mass. It has to contribute to to the flow, so you should always have. But maybe maybe it was a feed to the process versus the feed of a, it's a single species. Maybe that's where the confusion. Maybe is. Yeah, but in general, the feed out of the mixer should always be higher than the individual feeds. Otherwise, you'd have you know antimatter or something like that. Yeah. Uh, kind of a follow up on that. The reactor separator. Can you have a recycle ratio greater than one? Of course. Yeah. And how? I just don't get like physically. It seems like you're. Yeah, it is, it is a little bit confusing. So, so in the reactor separator, and I think it's a, a useful exercise. If we go through and kind of think about this, the difference between steady state operation and startup operation, right? So let, let's go through and think about this, right? <clears throat> so, I am just firing up my chemical plant, and I'm going to feed in 100 moles per minute into my process, right? I've got nothing to mix back, right, because I'm just starting it up. So that means 100 goes here, then I have a reaction, some little amount comes out, 
right? But maybe my reactor's not at temperature, right? So if it's an exothermic reaction, I might not even bother to heat my reactor up. I might just let the reaction do it. Or I might have a steam line that goes and heats up the reactor to get things fired up, because maybe some catalysts don't activate below a certain temperature. But let's say, for example, the reaction goes well the first time. Okay? Let's say it's a 50% conversion. That means I have 50 moles of my product and 50 moles of my unreacted material. Some of it goes down, some of it goes out. Maybe when I'm starting the reactor, I won't bother purging anything. And I'll send it all the way back. Well, then we've got 150 moles, right? Send it through again. Half of it reacts. We've got 75 moles. Some comes up, some comes back, some comes around. Right? Then we have a higher amount, and a higher amount, and a higher amount. So when we're starting up a reactor separator, we have an accumulation. Right? You have to have an accumulation when you start it up. But if your controls are operating correctly, as this starts to accumulate, you're going to start to throttle open your purge valve and start throwing that away. And depending on how much you open that purge valve, it depends how much is being sent back and recycling through and accumulating. And eventually you're going to reach a steady state where you're going to have more material potentially cycling through your system than is being fed. And once you've reached your steady state, then you're not going to have any additional accumulation. So if we were to look at, for example, uh, I'm going to call this uh, 2. Right, stream two. If I were to look at the molar flow rate of stream two as a function of time, I should start off at 100. Then what will happen is you'll have some sort of a function that will go up, and it'll eventually it'll level off. And this would be your steady state solution. Now, when we start to work on transient systems, what we're looking at here, the slope of this line is dn2 dt. At the end of the class, we're going to redo everything for transient systems. So we're not going to go and solve for the steady state solution, which we can solve by algebra. Right? We're just doing algebra right now. But in the, in later on, we're going to be solving for the transient or startup cases like draining a swimming pool, starting up a reactor separator, right? Right, so, so it looks like just a word problem, but in reality, how would I write accumulation as a differential? If this is a mass balance. It's dm dt, right? And I don't know if you guys in your thermodynamics class, did you guys do the open system energy balance? It starts off with du dt, right? That's the accumulation of energy. It's exactly the same thing for the mass balance. It's the accumulation of mass. Right? So the tricky part with the reactor separator is remembering that, yes, there is a startup period that involves a transient growth process. But we are actually only solving for the steady state solution. And then the steady state solution, dm dt, or d anything dt, goes to 0. And then this simplifies down into an algebraic expression. But in reality, life is much more complicated than that. Right? Because let's say we're draining a bathtub, right, or draining a swimming pool. The rate at which material drains is a function of the amount of material in the system, right? And so then you get these more complex relationships here, right? So the real, real world is a lot more complicated, right, because you actually have to follow physical rules and things like that. Same thing with heat transfer. The rate that heat is moved into a system is proportional to the temperature difference. Same reason why the rate that your bathtub drains is proportional to a pressure difference. The more pressure you have in the tub, the more hydrostatic force you have pushing everything out of the system. So these are good questions. Anything else? So what I'll end up doing is I can scan in the solutions uh, to these problems that uh, we did not have a chance to go over. Uh, so it's just, it's just two other examples. One of them is a, uh, I could just set it up real quick, is a, a stripping column. And in this particular example, we have a uh, contaminated airstream with SO2 at 5% and the rest is air. 
And coming out, we want to collect water with the SO2. And this is at the solubility limit. <coughs> right, so this is a design specification that says for every 100 grams of SO2, you require one kilogram of water. Right, that's the solubility of sulfur dioxide in water, which is going to be more realistic of a design specification than if I just you know, threw up and made up some number. Coming out of the top, we have mostly air plus 3% water. Now, why is it 3% water? It's humidity, right? If I mix air with water, some of the water is going to evaporate. And then coming into the system here, we're adding water. And for this particular example, if I call this 1, if N1 is equal to 100 moles or kilomoles per second, what is NH2O stream? I'll say 1, 2, uh, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say 1, 2, 3, 4. What is NH2O4? Basically saying, if I were to design this process, how much water would I need to add to the column in order to ensure that all of the sulfur dioxide could be theoretically dissolved into the water and I could remove it and clean up the airstream so we're not injecting nice brown air. Yeah, back there. What is what does that say on the stream 3H2O at what limit? Uh, solubility limit. So I just wrote SOL. So okay. solubility. So that's one of the example problems that I'll run through, but I'll scan the solutions and I'll post them onto Canvas uh, under the exam resources. Uh, and also, one other thing I forgot to know is I have uploaded exam one, two, and three objectives. That is a checklist of things that you may be asked to do on an exam, tasks and activities. You know, balance a process of reacting system using atom balances, right? But it's a list of actions. Not a list of ideas, but a list of actions that you should be able to do, I hope. I think that's how I worded it, right? But it's a list of things to go through, and you can use that as an internal checklist. Now, I forgot one thing uh, here. We got distracted a little bit with the combustion problems. Uh, but the last thing that's going to be on the exam is single phase properties. Right? That includes the ideal gas law and density conversions. Right? But that was included on the homework. There was a problem, for example, where you had uh, you're burning ethanol right? and it gave it to you in liters per minute or something. Right? So it was just a simple conversion to put it into mass flow rates. And same thing with uh, air flow rates, volumetric flow rates of air, you're able to convert that into moles. Right? So you will be asked ideal gas problems and uh, single phase material properties, like what is the density and how to convert it to mass or molar flow rates. Um, and then there's one other problem that uh, is a reactor separator um, without a purge stream, but uh, hopefully it's uh, clear enough on the notes that uh, we don't have to set it up. But in this case here, I really wanted to, to, to make sure we highlight this particular problem. We've seen a lot of reactor separators. That's pretty standard, right? But in some of the examples that we've done in class, we've had these sort of absorbing columns or stripping columns. And maybe one feed goes into a separate one. Right? So I just want everyone to be comfortable with the possibility of having a balance with more than just two streams or three streams. Right? A lot of the problems that we've done in the homework have been two or three streams because it's a separator but you could have more complex processes with more input and output streams. But everything algorithmically is exactly the same, right? It's just one extra term in your balance. So it still yeah. just goes down, so it's just, it's still N is equal to output for this situation? Of course, yeah. This is a non-reacting system, so all of your balances are molecule balances and they're all in versus out. Okay, all right. Uh, one page front and back of notes is what you're allowed, a calculator, and that's it, right? So see you on Friday.